Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiverr Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week from Wormspit, one of the great names of all time, Wormspit, Michael Cook. Michael, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, when it comes to putting names onto businesses, you got you hit the home run right there. <laughs> <laughs> I was really fortunate. It's short, and it's memorable, and it's gross. Yes. And so it's it's intriguing <laughs> enough for people to remember, but it's also good for kids. And I do a lot of educational programs. And so it, I was really lucky that I got that one early. I, I actually registered that in 2004, which seems like a lifetime ago now. And um, yeah, I was I was very fortunate to get that URL. Yep. That's a good one. That's a good one. All right. For those who don't know, Michael, now now we this is our 269th interview of this kind. And we've wow. talked to people all over the world who do all kinds of needlework at all levels. We have never talked to anyone who actually creates the silk that makes the thread that makes the stitching. And so Michael does needlework, weaving, and raises silkworms and collects the silk and makes it into threads. So, wow. Um, and in his spare time, he actually has a full-time job. <laughs> I like yeah. what we call the moth to cloth process. Yes, there we have it. Moth to cloth. Yes, that's excellent. So, all right. So now, now y- y- you sucked me in doing research on you because I'm a biology major. So uh, I had to go through the whole shooting match about, uh, and your your website is excellent in terms of how all of this happens and with photos and explanation. It really is well done. Um, for you know from the from the eggs all the way through it's uh, really a good job and i read i think just about all of it <laughs> just about it yep <laughs> well thank you it's really good yep so all right so you do need a work you do weaving and you raise silkworms and collect the silk and make it into thread which came first um they actually kind of marched along as parallel paths. So I started out as a little kid. I was always that kid that was out in the woods turning over logs and climbing trees. And I found wild moths and butterflies and caterpillars and and went home and looked up in my little golden guide and read about them and went and studied in the encyclopedia and learned about their life cycles and things like that. And at the same time, I was learning from my my mom and my mom's mom and my dad's mom, how to crochet and how to embroider and how to sew and how to, I actually ended up uh, teaching myself how to knit when I was in college because I couldn't, I didn't have quite the manual dexterity to be able to make the the needle come back through the, the hole with the yarn attached to it when I was five or six years old. But I was doing a lot of, of textile stuff when I was, a fairly little kid and I didn't realize that those two things were parallel paths until I was in my late twenties and a friend of mine, her daughter's teacher did a unit on quilting and each of the kids had decorated a square. They had little, little, uh, markers that they could mark on the squares and design patterns on them. And then she, the teacher, pieced the squares and invited the the parents to come in and sit and quilt. And I went on my friend's behalf because she couldn't that day. And I sat and, and quilted and I brought my own needle and thimble and I knew what I was doing and had fine, even stitches and it creeped all the other moms out. <laughs> and um, I had a really delightful conversation with the teacher and she raised silkworms every year as a class unit. And I'd heard, I'd heard the term silkworms. I'd heard, a, you know, just the phrase, that they were, you know, silkworms were used to make silk. I hadn't ever really studied the process. And once she told me about that, I started looking into it. And then it, just a few years later, I ordered some eggs and raised a batch of silkworms and started looking into how to make silk. And by that point, I was already spinning and weaving and dyeing and doing a lot of other things on the textile side. And so, like I said, these two paths just kind of evolved separately but but in parallel and then they kind of merged together and became this one wide path that has all these different branches to it and 
I started trying to figure out how to make silk from the cocoons. And I got a lot of very, very kindly, good natured discouragement from my local Weavers Guild who had had some terrible experiences with it. And there's there's certainly plenty of ways to do it wrong. There's a lot of, of things that can go horribly, horribly pear shaped when you're trying to do it. And I I worked my way through that and I found, you know, read a lot of books and um, found a lot of of resources. There was not a lot of resource on the web at that point. And that's one of the reasons that I've made my warm, my uh, warm spit website as information dense and as available as I can, because I really wish that I'd had a resource like that when I was trying to figure it out. Yeah. And so I, that's really, that's kind of, that's what's behind the evangelism and my interest in teaching is yeah, I, I feel was, like. I, I was huh? interested that there's not a whole lot. I think you say somewhere, there's not a whole lot of modern day information that you were actually had to study older books and articles and other things to get the information you needed. So many of the processes have been industrialized. Oh, and okay. so there are, there are excellent books, most of which are in Chinese. That excellent. Explain, That's no help. <laughs> that explain the process in terms of factories. Ah. And they don't explain the process in terms of, what to do in your backyard. And so the places that I found good information on sericulture for the individual at home were either very old books or they were uh, they were from places like uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, parts of India, where it's still done as a cottage industry. So you might have in the same way that that somebody might have a few chickens in the backyard for eggs, you might have a couple of trays of silkworms and you might just raise the silk and keep it for your own decorative use, you know, to embroider your own, your own skirt pieces, pardon me, or you might, you might raise them as a butter and egg type crop where you are selling it for a little bit of extra money, which, you know, helps to support your family or helps to buy luxuries or things like that. But um, the other thing is there were a lot of efforts in English literature and American literature for raising silkworms as a cash crop in the colonies and the Shakers tried raising silk and the Quakers tried raising silk and the Mormons tried raising silk. There were several fairly, fairly robust efforts at raising silk in North America and in England. And all of that information was, was aimed at basically educated laymen. And so all of that information I can read and understand fairly clearly, and that helped me a lot. Yeah. What uh, What was it that were you ever uh, able to discover what it was that prevented them from having success? Uh, there's a thing called a croisure, and it's actually it's a French word, and I'm sure that it is something more like croisure, but I'm not a French speaker, and so I say croisure because it it acknowledges the fact that I'm not speaking French, but I'm also <laughs> helping people to spell it because it's C-R-O-I-S-S-U-R-E, and it means crossing. And when the filaments come out of the hot water, when you're, when you're pulling them off of the cocoons, it, it binds them together and it agglutinates them. If you can imagine taking the six strands of, 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 that come off of a, a spool of embroidery uh, silk, of, of, of uh, embroidery cotton, and sort of like licking them and rubbing them together, it's sort of like that, except that it actually does glue them together a little bit. And so it makes one strand out of all of the strands that come off of the cocoons. And that was, that for me was the, the eureka moment. That was, that was the thing that made my silk work all of a sudden. And once I realized what it was, I started going back through more and more of the old books and realizing the places that I had failed to see it because it's in there. It's in there in a oh. lot of books. It's in there in a lot of old Chinese drawings. But if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, it's tiny and it's not, you know, there's not an arrow pointing to it and showing how it's done. It's just, it's part of a big drawing that has a whole bunch of things going on. And it's just this little bitty, little bitty thing with a, a, a bobbin. And once I learned that, then that makes, that makes the world of difference. Um, I can do without a lot of things, but I can't do without that crozier. 
So, okay, so that was, that's the key then. So the key to success there, kind of the crux of the whole thing, uh, because when that uh, silk thread, silk filament comes off those cocoons, that, I couldn't believe how unbelievably fine that is. That's really... It actually has its own its own set of measurements. It's actually measured in a thing called denier. And a denier is a coin. They actually measured it in a thing called a denier tournois. And it's it looks like a little like a dime that's been stepped on by an elephant. It's a little flat silver coin, about dime sized, very thin. And they would put a skein of silk of a known length and it it was different lengths at different times in history into a scale on one side. And then they would drop these coins into the other side until the scale balanced. And then that was the quality of that silk. So it could be 50 denier silk or hundred denier silk or 20 denier silk and finer, of course, is finer quality up to a certain point. You want it to be fine and even and without flaw but if it's too thick, it's more likely to have lumps. It's more likely to have splits. It's more likely to have irregularities, slubs, things like that. And so they, um, the silk cocoon is made of a single filament, unbroken filament, up to 1,500 yards in length. It's about nine-tenths of a mile. And that single filament varies through the length of the cocoon between two denier and three denier. And that denier has been standardized in modern measurement to be one gram per 9,000 meters of silk. <laughs> and so that the, the strand that's coming off of that cocoon is two to three grams per nine kilometers. And it literally will float in the air. It, I mean, if you, if you take a piece of it and just hold it up in the air, the, the air current will lift it up like a balloon and it'll just float like a spider web. And I have to be careful when I'm doing demonstrations in museums because I can't let them get into the air and get on things. Oh. Because, you know, that's a no-no in museums. But they, they really will just float up into the air. And, of course, once you get them glued together with a whole bunch of other strands, they're heavier and they're not going to go anywhere and they're more solid. But the individual strands are that fine. And that's, wow. that's one of the things that makes silk so amazingly supple and soft and shiny and all these other things is that it's such a fine fiber. But then for it to be that strong, that thin and that strong is amazing. Yeah, silk has a stronger breaking strength, which means pulling from both ends before it snaps, than any other natural fiber. Mm -hmm. And it's about 4.6 grams per denier. Um, and of course it varies per weight and the, the, the trick, everybody will say that silk is stronger per weight than steel wire. And it's the per weight that gets you because yeah. if you have, if you have a, a steel cable that weighs, you know, two pounds per foot and a silk rope that weighs two pounds per foot, that silk rope is going to be much larger around than the steel cable. And so it can look, it looks like the silk is a lot bigger, but it's actually the the requirement there is per weight. Mm -hmm. And what I do a lot of times when I'm I'm demonstrating this when I'm talking is I'll take a strand off the reel, which is about a 50 denier strand, and I'll start hanging my tools off of it because the the when I'm reeling, I'm actually using I've got a brush and I've got a ladle and I've got all these different tools, and I'll hang tools off of it. And, and have people guess how many tools I can hang off of it before it snaps. And it, usually I can get at least four or five tools hanging off of it before that little <laughs> tiny strand will snap. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. The, um, uh, the pictures on your website and the steps and everything, you mentioned that you uh, had not had any success at that time uh, with the eggs. So keeping the eggs and then cycling them back through the next time around. Are, are you further along with that or have, is that just something that's not worth the effort? So I've had success off and on with the eggs. And the challenge that I have is that they really need to be refrigerated because they have to go through a process called diapause. And diapause is like the insect's version of hibernation. And they go through a period where they are partially development 
developmentally halted. So they, they develop to a certain stage and then they pause and they have to go through a certain number of changes and then they start the next set of stages. And in the wild, that would be winter followed by spring. So they have to have a period of short days with short uh, photo periods, so for short uh, periods of light, followed with a cool temperature, followed by lengthening periods of light with warming temperature, spring. And so in a, in a home or a commercial environment, this means in the refrigerator, followed by in the living room. And the, the trick there is that if your refrigerator's vegetable crisper is not set at just exactly the right temperature for silkworm eggs, they can either dry out or hatch in the refrigerator or mold. And so I've had some difficulty with that off and on. I have, I have carried them year to year, many years. I often will order fresh stock so that I'm not having to worry about carrying them from year to year, but I do carry them year to year quite often. Oh, okay. So, so you have had, you have some success. I didn't realize that the uh, length of day would affect the eggs. So you have to manage that too then. They're actually, they're, remarkably complicated little organisms and there's especially some of the um the saturnid moth the giant silk moths like polyphemus and luna and some of the other species that i've raised have what's called light facultative diapause and they actually have a little cell on the forehead and it receives light information and that alters a hormone that builds up and tells it whether it's time to make a diapause cocoon or a non-diapause cocoon. And a diapause cocoon is thicker and stronger and designed to last through the winter. And a non-diapause cocoon is designed to hatch in, in a couple of months or less so that the moth can then mate and lay eggs for another cycle this season. And so that that determination is made based on light period and temperature and one of the one of the tricky things about trying to raise them in a home environment is you have to watch if they get if they get room light if you have the lights on the overhead lights that make the room bright or if you have uh, central heating or, or room heating that makes the room warmer or cooler you can trick them and you can you can mess with their sense of when it is and you can accidentally have cocoons hatching out in January and there's no leaves to eat. Oh, oh and, and of course, that's not what you want. You don't <laughs> want to have caterpillars that you can't feed. And so you try to keep them as much as possible on a natural cycle. I have mine, for the most part, during the winter, I keep them in an unheated garage that has a glass window on one side so that they can they receive natural daylight and natural darkness, which is just as important. And even though the, the garage does have a light that we turn off and on when the cars go in and out, it's not on all the time and the garage isn't heated. And so it doesn't ever freeze in there, but it won't get, you know, it's not going to be warm like it is in the house. Right. I love hearing all these scientific uh, terms. Uh, one of my favorite uh, courses in college, we, ha we had to uh, do a summer course and it was all field work. And there were three different uh, segments, and uh, and one was insects that spend all but the adult life underwater, and uh, stomping around in streams and creeks and stuff, looking for larvae and and you know sub <laughs> sub whatevers, and uh, and then th that was the first time I discovered that uh, the adult form is nothing more than just reproduction and then die. And uh, and these moths do the same thing, you know, because people think, oh, those, the moth is the culmination, and and really, it's such a small part of the whole life cycle that it, it really is almost, other than making the eggs, almost trivial. I like to think of them like a blossom. Yeah. You know, it's it is they are definitely an important part. They're a critical part of the life cycle. But yeah, they are not in the sense that they're not like we think of most mammals an adult, you know, where they're making determinations that are changing the life cycle for everybody else, they are the breeding stage. And so the, all of the silk moths have no mouth. 
And so they're they're similar to those ephemeroptera that you were talking about. They're probably the mayflies and other other right. similar things like that. Right. They don't have any way of taking in nutrition. And so they they live on stored fat and stored moisture. And so they have between five and ten days until they just run out of juice. And some of them were literally just like sit in place and you don't realize that they're dead until you poke them and they don't move. And some of them will will kind of run down like the Energizer bunny. They go through a series of twitches as their bodies shut down, but they, they really do just run out of energy. They run out of, of fat and moisture. And if it's cooler, they last longer because they, they uh, expend that fat and energy more slowly. And if they're in a situation where they are not able to mate, they last longer because that's, that takes up most of their activity. So if they're not, if they're not uh, receiving the pheromone input that tells them to fly into the wind and go find a female and all this other stuff, or if the female is not, not receiving the input that tells her that she's been impregnated and she should go lay eggs, they're waiting and they wait and they don't, they don't expend energy in that, that period. And so they, they last longer at that point. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's what makes the difference between five days and 10 days. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now I was fascinated by the fact that um, the, the moss that you grow, that you use for the majority of your uh, silk production, that the genetics of those have gotten to the point where they can't fly. I mean, they're, they're just almost other than egg laying. They really can't do much of anything. Is that, is that an intentional thing? Uh, because the genetics produce better silk, uh, or is that just a, a normal course of things just through silk production? I think that a lot of the changes that have occurred in Bombyx mori are were directed by breeding for silk, both in quantity and quality. Um, some of the things like the lack of flight, I think, are probably coincidental. I don't think that that was, let's breed for ones that don't fly. I yeah. think that just happened. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got, you know, if you've got a tray with a thousand moths in it and 500 of them fly away instantly, you're not going to get the eggs from those. <laughs> you're going to get the eggs from the ones that stay in the tray. And for the most part, most of these, most of the females of these wild moths don't fly much anyway. They don't fly as much as the males do. The males do most of the traveling and the females mostly wait. And after they're bred, then they will fly off to lay their eggs. But so they are, they are not as likely to fly to begin with, but as the flightlessness, the complete whiteness is definitely a side effect of being bred for silk because the moths are almost completely white and the caterpillars are are almost completely white. They have a little bit of patterning on them, but um, there is a wild species, Bombyx mandarina, and a lot of people. I've I've seen a lot of books, and they that say Bombyx mori no longer exists in the wild. And the thing that that gets me about this is that it's it's not it's not even wrong. It's it's <laughs> it's a mistaken equivalency because it's like saying cocker spaniels no longer exist in the wild. Bombyx, Bombyx mori is a human bred animal. It was made from Bombyx mandarina over the course of, of centuries and millennia of careful breeding. And we have actually bred it so much that we've changed its N number. We've changed the number of genes that it has. Mm. And the, that's right, the number of chromosomes that it has in its in its genome. And it can be bred back to the wild type, and it definitely produces intermediate behavioral and, and uh, phenotypic qualities. But the wild type still exists, and it's it's considered a significant pest in silkworm areas because everything that it wants to eat is exactly what your domesticated silkworms want to eat. And every disease that it can catch, your domesticated silkworms can catch. And so they have to they have to try to treat for them, but you can't use any insecticide that can kill your <laughs> domesticated silkworms because you'll kill your silkworms with it. And I've raised them and they're phenomenal little critters. They are they're remarkably camouflaged. 
the the caterpillars, the Bombix mandarina caterpillars, look exactly like a mulberry branch to the point of having markings that look like bark scars and leaf buds. Mm. They will. Um, there's a behavior in a lot of silk bearing insects where if they're if they're startled, they will drop off the branch. And then when the, whatever it is was scaring them goes away, they'll climb back up their little silken cord to get back up on the branch and continue eating. And Bombyx mori doesn't do that. Bombyx mori just falls to the ground. Bombyx, it's, it's been bred out. But yeah. Bombyx mandarina will climb back up that little string. Um, Bombyx mandarina is a strong flyer, the wild type. And that has just been bred out of the domesticated species. And it is considered a species now. Bombyx mori is considered a species of its own. But like I said, it is very much like Cocker Spaniel. It is a thing that people have made for a thing that we want. It's, it's, yeah. it's been created for human needs. It's, it's so interesting to hear you talk because Beth and I have had more than one discussion about the importance of, of art in the school curriculum. And to hear what you've been through for to, to generate material for art, the history, <laughs> the science, you know, all the things that have stemmed from that, that, that you obviously have studied to the nth degree, all to create something for art. And it really speaks to how important art is in the, in the greater mix. It's well, for me, I find the whole thing fascinating, and especially I find the wholeness of it fascinating, the fact that it does have these aspects of biochemistry and history and political science and you know, all of these different things going into silk, to me, makes it rich and complex and beautiful because it's not just you know, a string that I can, I, that I can make a pattern with. It every stitch has a story with it, and and it has, you know, all of this biology and history, and mm. I can I can explain all of these other things using that same that same piece. I can I can look at it and talk about, you know, this piece of embroidery is done with this kind of silk and made with this kind of pattern, which came from this country, which has this history, you know, it's, right. it's a very rich whole thing. Right. That's exactly it. Yeah. All that comes from, from art. Yes. As its core. Yes. It's, uh, it's amazing. The other thing that was interesting to me is before we started doing fiber talk, I did a podcast for Marine aquariums and people who raise uh, coral and Marine fish and marine fish are uh, an animal that goes through several larval stages before it becomes the fish that we see that settles and, and uh, lives on the, on the reef. And the importance uh, of raising, uh, breeding and raising marine fish, the, the food, having the right food at the right times in each larval stage is, is more critical than having the fish. Because they, hmm. they just won't make it. And so then I was, it, it, as you were talking about the, the mulberry leaves and, and each of the stages, making sure there's enough and that it's close enough to them. And then in that final stage that they have to have so much, uh, my, my mind went to the, the process and the obligation to grow mulberry so that you have enough every time. There's actually a whole a whole branch of agriculture called moriculture that is devoted to the raising of mulberry leaves specifically for sericulture. <laughs> and yeah, there's a whole, I mean, you can, you can buy books on how to raise mulberry leaves because it's, it's, and it's got its own science and it's got its own history and they raise, they raise specific varieties, particularly for mulberry or for her uh, um, mm -hmm. silkworm forage and they're higher in nitrogen and more protein, and they produce more foliage and less fruit so that they are better forage for the silkworms. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating how they, how they manage all of that. And there's, there's all these – there's 
again, when, when you look at the modern Sarah culture handbooks, and then you look back at the, at the old books and the old books, a lot of times were aiming at the same information with a, with a different kind of understanding of the world. And one of the old books that I saw said that you should take the worms that take the eggs out of cold storage when the mulberry leaves were the size of a mouse's ear and that every caterpillar should be given a mulberry leaf its own age. In other words, if you had a five-day-old caterpillar, it should be eating five-day-old mulberry leaves. Uh. And it's not actually that picky. You don't have to worry about the days. But it actually, as they get older, the mulberry leaves go from having the, – the youngest mulberry leaves are very high in sugar – and very low in fiber and protein. As they get older, they are lower in sugar, higher in fiber and protein. And it's that fiber and protein that the silkworms need as they get bigger to produce more silk. And so if you feed too many old leaves to young caterpillars, they can't eat them because they're too tough and too full of fiber and protein, and they can't chew them with their little tiny, tiny jaws. And if you feed too many young leaves to old caterpillars, it's like feeding, you know, it's like feeding somebody mashed applesauce for dinner. It's, it's, it's not nourishing to them and it can upset their digestion because it doesn't have the, the, the fiber and protein that they need. Right. And the modern books have a lot more specific detail about, you know, you, you feed the largest glossy leaf to this stage and then you feed, they, you know, will actually show a drawing of a stem and which leaves go to which stages of caterpillar. And some of the older books have, have kind of more of a, a rule of thumb about how to do it. But the, the, the more modern books are much more scientific and more particular. So do you raise your own mulberry trees? I, I do raise mulberry trees. I have three mulberry trees that are in giant pots, like a 20 gallon pot. I have one mulberry tree that was in the yard when I bought the house. When my husband and I were looking at this house, that was one of the things that we were like, oh, we can live here. It has a mulberry tree in the front yard. And I do use those leaves sometimes, but where I am in Texas and actually in many parts of the United States, mulberry is what's considered a trash tree and they're just everywhere. And so I forage a lot of my mulberry. I just go, there's a, a, a vacant lot close to us that used to have uh, rows of houses. And so it's got like driveways cut into it, but then, you know, they've been completely demolished. There's just, there's just an empty, empty lot with trees on it, but several of them are mulberry trees and they had planted mulberry as shade trees. And I just go and pick those a lot of times because that way I can, I can pick, two or three trash bags full without decimating my own trees at the house. And they, when they are in that last stage, they do, they do go through quite a lot. And so I will, I'll, I'll go and pick, you know, several branches, like uh, a couple of inches across and I'll, I'll take a lopper out and pick a bunch of big branches and bring them home and, and keep them in a bucket of water and then just feed them off as we go. When the uh, larvae are growing, then that is absolutely critical to have a constant supply of the right kind of mulberry leaves. Then, yeah, um, it's it's considered full time work for one person to have ten thousand caterpillars. So when you're if you are trying to figure out, so you have you know so many hectares under cultivation with mulberry and this much square footage of rearing house and things like that. And you're trying to figure out how you, how many staff people you need. If you're trying to raise, you know, 500,000 caterpillars, you probably need 50 staff people to feed them constantly um, because they, they do require to be fed typically four to five times a day at the last stage. Uh, the first stage, a lot of times you can feed them once every day or even once every other day because they are just so small. They're so little bitty that they don't go through it very fast. But at that last stage, they are constant. And when you open the room door where they're inside with the, the, in their trays, you can actually hear them. And they sound kind of like rain on the roof or Rice Krispies. They're a, kind of a little light pattering sound. 
And a lot of people think that it's actually the munching of their jaws. And I've sat and watched them very carefully. It's a little bit of that, but it's mostly their feet. It's their feet opening and closing on the leaves and stems that they're walking along. Uh -huh. But it, it really does sound like you're in a room with rain. <laughs> That's interesting that it, that it sounds like that and not, it, it, it's not like a cacophony of noise, but just like a rain coming down. Yeah, it's just this kind of light patter. Well, I mean, it's it's amazing to think that you're hearing caterpillars at all. Oh, just so many that they're making a noise. That's just amazing. I've tried to get I've tried to record it, but it's it's you've got to basically get a microphone and hold it up to a tray. And I've I've found several other recordings online of the of the sound. And it just like I said, it sounds like somebody holding a, a microphone up to a bowl of Rice Krispies. Yeah. It sounds like when they get to the is it the fifth instar, fifth stage? Uh -huh. that you're, you're basically like a dairy farmer. You can't leave home. It's yeah. I, I, I have to plan my, my schedule around that because that's about a week long. That stage is a, is a week to 10 days. And I, I will occasionally ask my husband to take care of caterpillars for me if I've got to go somewhere or I will, if both of us have to go somewhere, I have actually had caterpillar sitters but I will not make that happen in that last week because it's just, it's just too much. It's, it is, it's a lot. And I, when I was trying to explain to somebody, you know, it's, it's like the difference between if you, if you bake brownies and you think, Oh, I'm going to bake some brownies and you make say two pans of brownies. That's great. And then you have to make 20 pans of brownies and you realize that that not only involves shifts in the oven but it also means you have to wash the pans and there's there's a lot more going on once you start getting to that that last stage where it's really busy and i can't i can't make another person do that <laughs> so I, I definitely i don't i don't leave them at that stage yeah and and once they start spinning that can get a little out of hand as well because they all start spinning quite close to the same time and for for best quality, you do try to keep them fairly closely synchronized. Um, a lot of the professional sericulture folks actually uh, manage hatching time with a technique called black boxing, and it's exposure to light at certain times, and it, it causes them to all hatch at exactly the same time on the same day so that they go through all of their changes at the same time on the same days. And then they start spinning at the same, within a few hours of each other. And because you're trying to industrialize a process, you know, you want to make them behave as much like a little cog as you possibly can. And you don't want them to, you know, dilly dally or, or take their time at these different things. And so I'm, I'm not quite that regimented, but I do, I do definitely notice they will start spinning. I, I, we'll see, uh, pardon me, just a few the first day. And then say if I've got a, if I've got a batch of a thousand, I'll see probably 20 the first day. And then I'll see like 200 the next day and then 600 the next day and then <laughs> 200. And then, and then the rest of them will kind of taper off. I'll have 10 or 15 for a few days after that. But that, that giant batch in the middle happens over the course of one or two days and when they all want to spin, you've got to get each one of them its own little special space to spin in. And I tend to put them in empty toilet paper tubes. So that you're still you're still doing that then? Well, it's just convenient. Yeah, um, I, I threw Chris, away a paper towel roll today and thought about <laughs> you. <laughs> so traditional sericulture actually uses a thing that looks like the the divider that goes in between bottles in a box. If you've seen, like, like if you get a box full of jars of pickles and you pull out the jars of pickles, there's this divider thing that comes out of the middle. Mm -hmm. It looks like it looks like that. It's it's cardboard cut into shapes that that interlock with each other, and it makes little cells of a perfect size. And I have Chris has made some for me out of cardstock, and the problem there is that it's difficult to get them to um, last well because I didn't they weren't they weren't heavy enough cardstock they need to be heavier uh, like 
what I really need is something like the the backing that goes on a, a steno pad. Uh. But um, anyway, that's the traditional version. Either looks like that, or they can make a little a little frame out of straw that has little cells in it. But anything that gives them spaces that are fairly small will work. And I've actually used, there's a, a Greek technique of using branches from a specific kind of oak tree. And I've used live oak branches to do that with and gotten some fairly good results with that because it gives them, because of the way the leaves are shaped, it gives them those little spaces that they need to be able to make their cocoons in. And if the spaces are too small, then it makes flawed cocoons. And if the spaces are too big, then two caterpillars get in the same space and make a cocoon together, which is another, a different kind of flaw. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with cocoons, and it impacts the quality of the silk, and it it uh, it can make it more difficult to make silk out of the cocoons. Yeah. What uh, w when it comes to to the cocoons. The um, and you know, and, and and having them in the in the paper towel, uh, the toilet paper uh, things is it is it one per tube or are you able to get one at the top and one at the bottom? So once the caterpillar has started spinning its cocoon, it's made the cocoon so that it is, um, it's it doesn't have to be finished, but it has to be one complete round so that it, it is the shape is started, I can put another one in next to it and it will make a cocoon that is adjacent to, but not touching the other one. And so I can actually put on a good day four in the same tube, one after another with time spacing in between. I can't put four in at once, but I can put, I can fill a set of tubes and come back and you know, the next day, look at those tubes and see if I can put more in them and I can get three or sometimes four into a tube. And then once they get to where they are about two to three days old, they're firm enough that I can take them out and oh. then have more free up more space. Oh. And they, they will continue to spin for three days and then they are ready for harvest at about 10 days. And you want, ideally, you want to get them after they have changed from what's called a pre-pupa into the pupa, but before they come out as a moth. And you've got about a, you've got about a 10 day to 15 day window to make that happen. Mm -hmm. hmm. The, and, and it was interesting to me, um, cause you know, that, you know, the, the PETA people get all worked up over those things, but you know, obviously you have to kill the, the pupa, um, at some juncture and I, I wondered why. And, and then when you explain that it, it exudes or excretes a material to dissolve the silk so that it can get out and become the moth. And then I could see uh, why you, you don't want it emerging. You don't want, uh, cause that, that wrecks everything. Yeah, it actually, I, you have to choose. And so like with any crop where you're going to destroy the seed. So if like, if you're raising wheat, if you were to raise a crop of wheat and you took every single grain to the miller and made them into flour, you're screwed for next year right? because you have no wheat left to plant. And so you're going to save the best part and that's going to be your crop seed for next year. And you take the rest of it to the miller. And it's exactly the same with the, with these cocoons. You save a portion of the best cocoons, and those are your seed cocoons, and you, they're allowed to hatch and breed and lay eggs. And then the rest of them have to get the, – the technical term in sericulture is stifled. And, yes, the PETA people do get very exercised about it. <laughs> um, I've gotten death threats. I have not gotten uh, – Get out. What I would you consider, have, you have. I have gotten, I have had people that have told me that they want to put me in the oven and watch me and see what I do. Um, I don't think of them as credible death threats. I wasn't really losing sleep about it, but yeah, that's. I mean, I've I've gotten letters like that for emails, um, and <laughs> so you 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 process those so that they're dry, and at that point they're they're essentially shelf stable. 
some of the techniques will actually, instead of drying them, will boil them. And the only problem with that is then they have to be worked immediately. And so if you're if you're not drying them, you are very time limited on when you can do it. So if you're if you're going from what they call green cocoons, which are the cocoons with the live insect inside, you get a better quality of silk, but the difference in quality is not one that I am sophisticated enough to be able to discern, but it it very significantly limits what you can do with your week. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that means that means that the silk day has to happen on a very specific time schedule and you don't have any choice over that. And with a with a full time job and other things happening in my life, I don't I don't want to do that. And so I do dry my cocoons that I'm going to use for making silk. And by shelf stable, that means at your leisure or is there still some limit? Um, they're good for a couple of years. Oh, okay. And so once they're once they're dry, and like with anything where they are a natural product, it's important that they are good and dry. And I I store them in a metal container so that they are proof against insects and also proof against rodents. Mm. And I learned that the hard way, unfortunately. Oops. Um, we got some squirrels got into the garage, but oh. um. Yeah, apparently they're delicious. Oh, but I didn't. That's funny. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it was. It's it, it's funny now. <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> funny then. Um, yeah. But uh, anyway, they they need to be really good and dry so that they won't mold. And after they once they're good and dry and they're stored appropriately, they're good for a couple of years. I buy a lot of commercial cocoons. I actually end up most of the silk that I make when I'm doing talks, when I'm I'm explaining to a, a museum group or talking to a school or something like that. Most of those are grade A number one cocoons from China. And the difference there really is very much like tomatoes. And so commercial tomatoes are very uniform. They're very round. They're very perfect. They're very, you know, grown under controlled conditions. They've been inspected and they're very consistent. And your homegrown tomatoes may be more delicious. They may have more charm. They may be different varieties. They're not as consistent and they may have, you may have to work with them a little bit more to get, you know, you may have to cut this little corner off where it got a little sunburned or there may be a worm in that one you're going to have to work around. And when I'm talking, I need for the cocoons to not be giving me challenges. And so I, I work a lot with commercial cocoons because they are consistent and they behave very consistently. Mm -hmm. And so I produce a lot of filament doing these talks and I end up, I end up making a lot of, of silk out of commercial cocoons. Oh, okay. Now it's still, it's still handmade from cocoon filament, filament silk, but it's not all silk that I raised. Right. The, I guess I knew this, but it was fascinating to learn that those cocoons are one thread. And what, what was the lear learning process to find how to get that one thread to start to unravel? Um, one that again was one of those, yeah. that was one of those things that the information that I started getting when I was looking at it had a lot of uh, different versions, some of which worked better than others. And one, one author recommended dunking each cocoon into the boiling water, picking it up, and then taking a toothbrush and gently brushing the outside of the cocoon with a toothbrush until you locate the end and then putting it into a different cup. And I finally started finding commercial methods. And you take about 50 and you put them into a container of boiling water and you you sort of dunk them with the brush. And I've got some good video on the website of this. And you dunk them until they they get they don't really get completely cooked through, but the silk starts to absorb a little bit of water. And then you're you're dunking them and you're scrubbing at them with this brush. And if you can imagine you've got a box full of balls of yarn and you've got a rake 
and you're raking at the balls of yarn, you're going to catch something off the outside of the balls of yarn. And if you pick up those strands that you're catching with the rake and just start pulling on those strands, eventually you're going to end up with a wad of yarn in one hand and a string connecting that wad to the balls of yarn that are sitting on the pile. And that's basically what's happening. You're pulling off a, a little bit of waste from the outside of each cocoon until you get one strand connecting the cocoon to the waste in your hand. And it can happen actually fairly quickly. It takes mm, less than a minute usually um, to, to, it's called groping to find the end. And you can find the end on, on 30 or 40 cocoons fairly quickly like that. Ironically, it's actually easier to find the end on 50 cocoons than it is to find the end on five cocoons because they help each other. The mm -hmm. strands pull on the other strands and, and pull them upward and make that process easier. And then once I've found the ends, I can pull sideways and the whole bundle of cocoons that's attached to the ones in my hand will will follow like little lambs and then I'll dip them out with a spoon and put them into another kettle and I'm, I'm sitting here miming this as I'm talking to make sure I'm doing this right <laughs> um, but I'll I'll dip them out with a spoon and put them into the other kettle and then I'll wrap the the ends that I've got tied off around the handle of that kettle so I know where the ends are and then I'll go in, and use the brush again and catch more ends and once you are done catching all the ends the rest of it is literally unwinding. And so you're unwinding these cocoons and each one is like a tiny, tiny ball of yarn. And the caterpillar spins for three days and no nap and no snack and no pause. It just does this little figure eight motion back and forth all around the inside of the cocoon for three days, making it thick and solid and 1500 yards of silk and that's so amazing. you're just 1500 you're just yards. unwinding that's just yeah amazing. it's just it's astounding um and 1500 is a grade a cocoon and so that's that is it's actually 1400 meters is the 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 metric for a grade a cocoon and i just round it to yards because it's it's makes more sense for mostly my american audience um but there there is a significant amount of grading in cocoons just like with any any commercial agricultural product um you know you can buy different grades of tomatoes or blackberries or any anything that you want to purchase or beef or eggs or whatever cocoons are exactly the same and so if you are going to reel cocoons, make sure that you get cocoons that are are graded for reeling, which is going to be the grade A number ones, because they've been inspected and they they're free from a certain kinds of flaws that will make it they'll make them easier to work with and make them better quality for for reeling. And when when you start to reel these things and you have multiple cocoons that you've you've got you found the thread how many of them do you do as a group is it as many as possible i mean because then then it becomes you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking it's a good thing you learn how to to um, knit because the principles all start to merge merge together here but uh, how many how many fibers do you do you work at one time so I find that for me, I want a strand of about 20. Okay. And that gives me a, a filament between 40 and 50 denier in weight. If your thread, your filament is too fine, it is more likely to tangle and to snap and to stick together and there are those kind of problems that you have with a very thin, very fine filament. If your filament is too thick, it is more likely to have lumps and slubs and uneven spots, and it will not be as shiny and it will not be as supple. And so you, you have to balance fine 
to, to thick based on what you want to do with the yarn. And most of the time, the yarn that I want is a fairly fine, fairly even yarn with a great deal of shine to it. And so I want a fairly fine filament to build my yarn with. Now, the stuff that, that comes out of the reel, which is that filament, which is about approximately 20 cocoons run together, and that that croisure that I was talking about earlier, that, that assembly of pulleys agglutinates those threads together. So if you can imagine, like I said, if you if you were to take all six strands of some cotton embroidery floss and run some kind of sticky glue through it and rub it in between your palms so that it it, it gets made into one strand, that's kind of what you're looking at here. You're looking at multiple strands that are glued together so that it looks like one strand when it's finished and it behaves like one strand. And it's also slightly stiff and wiry. The Saracen in the silk makes it stiff and wiry. And I take that strand and then I build my yarn with it. And so most of the time, the, the yarn that I weave with is mostly a three by three organzine. And so I'll take three of those strands, twist them together to make a single. I'll take three of those singles, twist them back together the opposite direction to make a three ply. And that's my three by three organzine. And that's the weight of a size C silk sewing thread. So that's most of the most of the sewing thread that we get that is a, a commercial silk sewing thread is size A. And size C is not quite as big as buttonhole silk, but it's in that direction. It's toward the size of buttonhole silk. And so I want something that's that's slightly heavier than regular silk sewing thread. I've made silk sewing thread. I've put it in my sewing machine in the in the needle end to uh, to make sure that I could do it, to make sure that it would behave and connect stitches, and it does. Um, but most of what I'm working with, I want to have it a little bit heavier, just just for the quality of what I want to work with. Is the is the thread that you get out of your process? as good as better than not as good as what we would buy commercially in a needle workshop. Um, and you're going to say it depends. I know you are, but <laughs> no, well, no, actually a lot of times I have purchased needlework silks for study, cut them apart, carefully measured the number of twists per foot, Try to figure out how many cocoons go into it, which is is a very challenging. Trying, you know, a lot of it's guesswork. Yeah. But um, you now I'm I'm trying to figure out how, like for instance, swaplat, Krynik swaplat, is their swaplat technically means flat silk, and it's not quite flat. It's actually got uh, two and a half turns per inch, and you don't realize that it has two and a half turns per inch until you tape it flat to the table and and run a needle through the middle of it to see actually how many turns it has but it does have just a little bit of twist to keep it together and keep it from tangling and to make something that is very similar to Krynik Swaplat I take about four to five strands of my filament and run them together and twist it about three times per inch and and then I untwist it a little bit after the after the the boil off process. Um, some of the stuff that I've raised myself, so the cocoons that I've raised at home, the filaments themselves are finer, and so that yields a silk which is slightly more supple and lustrous than most of the stuff that I can get at a commercial um, from a commercial vendor. A lot of the stuff that I'm I'm making looks more like the stuff that you're going to get from the Japanese Embroidery Center, oh. mm -hmm. and that's that's really what I'm aiming for. I'm I'm aiming for that quality of silk more so than the stuff that that you're getting from uh, mostly needlepoint focused, and it's not so much that the the yarns are not fit for purpose. It's that they're producing more filament yarns. And 
a lot of the a lot of the yarns that are being a lot of the silk yarns that are used in needlepoint in various places are spun rather than reeled silks. Oh, okay. And I am I am primarily interested in the reeled silks more so than the spun silks. I've made spun silks. They're beautiful. They're interesting. I don't get around to doing it because I have if I have spare time, I've got I've got silk to reel. I've got you know I've got other things to do that I want to do first, and I don't get around to doing that stuff as often because that's not my my primary interest. Yeah. But the the spun silk is made from once the reeled silk is taken off, there is when I was talking about when I when I brush the cocoons and I've got waste in my right hand and string between my my right hand and the cocoons, what's in my right hand goes into making spun silk. Mm-hmm. That's called reeler's waste. And then anytime any of the equipment snarls, so if a spool breaks somewhere or you know a pulley catches on something and something snarls in the gears. You cut that off with a knife, and that goes into a bucket, and that goes in to make spun silk. And spun silk is made from a a, um, a combed top. So they they boil the gum off of it. They put it through a combing machine, which makes it into you know cards it out to fluff, just like you do with cotton or wool. And then they have a ring spinning machine, which draws it down into a little tiny thin fiber and adds twist to it at the same time as drafting it. And then they twist it back to ply it, and then they make it into skeins, just like you would with cotton or wool. And it is for from from the perspective of the whole thing of sericulture, it's considered a product made from good quality waste. Mm. And I had this this discussion with one of the the uh, the spinning wheel folks, and he's like, "But but we get the grade A number one." I'm like, "Yes, it's like grade A number one ground sirloin. It is the very best <laughs> stuff that you can get after the stakes are cut out. You know, after the reeled silk is gone, this is the best stuff that you can get. But it's still going to have under under magnification. It's still going to be hairy. It's yeah. still going to have little tiny threads sticking out sideways." which cause it to look more pearly and less glossy. And a lot of times those silk yarn, the spun silk yarns are what's called gassed. So they actually, they, they spin the yarn and then they run it at high speed past a series of gas flames and they singe off those little sticking out hair pieces. And it makes the yarn less furry and more shiny. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, it's dyed and processed and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, I was amazed. Uh, the pictures of the silk, the, the filament that you produce, how much shine there is. Uh, it's remarkable. Yeah, and, and, and that was the pictures. I got to believe in person it's even more so. Wow. One thing I learned, and uh, there's a there's a, a book that I've been working on, a, a transcription of from – uh, Nicholas Geff. It was called The Perfect Use of Silkworms and Their Benefit. And he was trying to convince King James that England should be raising their own silkworms and the colonists should be raising silkworms and sending silk back to England. And he talks about the chief the chief beauty of the silk is its gloss. And that really is the the thing that sets it apart from all these other from wool and linen and all these other fibers is the sheen. And now we don't think anything about it because polyester and rayon and nylon and all these other things have a lot of gloss to them. But if we're looking at, you know, 150 years ago or 500 years ago, there was nothing like silk. You know, it was the only thing that had that kind of reflective and refractive glossiness to it you know you get a certain amount of gloss out of like a fine linen but but you know not not for the most part yeah yeah it's it's nothing it's nothing like what you get with silk yeah all right we're gonna we're gonna run out of time i knew this would happen (laughs) got got to learn about dyeing okay what uh is is it fairly straightforward or difficult to get the get it to take the dye and, and loves this, now I'm way out of my element. This is what Beth does. She she does the dying part. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, like to, I like to dye things, yes, all the time. 
so, so silk silk loves dye and silk takes dye really well there are a lot of dye sites on the silk fiber molecules um if you typically you dye the silk after the gum has been removed. So the sticky part that I was talking about that glues those fibers together is saracen, and that's a protein. And you remove the saracen with a bath of typically either an enzyme or an, a, an alkaline and a, a surfactant. I use washing soda and Orvis paste, and it removes it. It makes it soft and supple and shiny and, and whiter, less, less color to it. And then it opens up the dye sites and you can dye it with, usually um, most silk is dyed with acid dyes or it's dyed with a variety of natural dyes. And sometimes it requires mordants and sometimes it doesn't. I am not a natural dyer. I've done a little bit of natural dye in workshops that other people ran. So I've, I've seen it happen. I've, I've put my fingers in the dye pot. I haven't done it. Um, I have done commercial uh, acid dyes in my house and it's I mean it is it is easier to dye than a lot of fibers because of its receptivity to dye um, but it's most of the time what I'm doing is a dip dye process where I want the entire skein to be a very consistent even color all the way through and it's you know you you dunk the fiber into the into the liquor of color up and down and up and down until you get the right color and then you set it with with uh, heat and steam and it's that's how you it, set it is heat and steam you don't need to it does it do the commercial ones need an extra mordant then um they are typically pre-metalized and i i'm not enough of a dye chemist to know anything more than that word but i know that they are typically the the dyes that are I'm usually using either Prochem or Dharma, uh, yeah. Dharma Jacquard dyes or Prochem, um, I forget the name of the, Lanaset, Lanaset dyes um, that are, are set up for silk and wool. And they are, they contain already the part that makes them work. And I don't, I am not enough of a chemist to be able to explain other than that, but I know that they are pre-metalized and that that makes it work. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because it's, it and so you don't need to rinse them again then so you you just dunk them in the dye bath and then you set them with the heat because when you when we do cotton we have to rinse them when we're done we use the the cold um a low immersion dye bath and then you end up having to to rinse and rinse and rinse and that's it's just the worst thing to do with threads i mean i don't mind doing it with um, fabric but rinsing those threads can be a royal pain <laughs> I do rinse and rinse just to make sure that I don't get bleeding and staining because of a particular project that I, I did with some really beautiful black and red and white stuff that, that didn't, wasn't fast because I didn't Oops. rinse enough. Um, a lot of times dark colors have free dye, which isn't, isn't completely bound. And that it was, it was a problem in this one particular piece but I do rinse quite a bit, and I will typically rinse with water until the water runs clear, and then rinse with citric acid. And the citric acid neutralizes any remaining alkaline from the degumming process, and then I rinse with water again, and then I rinse with a thing called Milsoft. And if you folks don't have Milsoft, oh my gosh, go get Milsoft, because it is the most awesomest thing ever. Um, it's a fabric softener. It's a fatty acid ester, and Prochem has one they call ProSoft, and it's it just it feels like fabric softener on your fingers. It is a fabric softener, but it doesn't have any fragrance. It doesn't have any color, and it is designed not to interfere with dyes and colors. So you can, you know, use it in in various stages without interfering with the process, but it is amazing at restoring the suppleness of silk yarn because sometimes once you've once you've run it through the dye bath and let it dry it can feel a little stiff because it's been washed and and hung to dry and the millsoft restores that lovely supple silkiness to it that is is so typical of silk and we all want silk to be that way and the other thing that i do is called lustering and you take the skein 
and you run you put a stick through either end of the skein and you twist from one end until the the skein is twisted really really tight and then you kind of stretch it and it wrings the water out but it also stretches the fibers and makes them very straight and long and then you kind of you take it off of the off the sticks and you put your hands in the middle of it like you're um like like someone's going to wind the yarn off your fingers and you pull your hands apart and pop the silk like like <laughs> pop it back and forth and it it breaks up any of that residual tightness or stiffness in the yarn and makes it soft and lovely and those are those are things that I would do with any kind of yarn because that's that that mill soft or the pro soft and that that lustering tightening process as long as you don't overstress it it it's it makes a lot of other kinds of fibers happy as well Oh, I'm going to have to go try this. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Because, you know, that's the problem when I dye my own threads are, you know, they do feel different. You know, you've dumped it in the dye bath, you, you've rinsed and rinsed and rinsed them, and they just don't, they don't feel the same, you know, because you've done so much to them. And I've always wondered, well, what am I doing wrong? You know, there's got to be another step here because if you buy commercial, they still feel, they still feel nice in your hand. Hmm. All right. I really recommend that stuff. Okay. <laughs> and you don't need a big bottle. You 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 buy it by the pint and use it by the teaspoon. Okay. All right. So it's like the um the what they use for washing. Um well you've got the orbis um which works the paste. But there's something else. Centerpol. I was trying to think of the name of it. We use yeah. that. Centerpol is another detergent. Centerpol is, is this is this is a fabric softener. Right, right. But yeah, you this don't is a, the center fall either you know they just need the dab of the of the right they yeah, use it in small volume okay great oh thanks for the tip <laughs> mm -hmm. Ooh, beth will be doing some thread here coming up i can tell <laughs> uh, i got to give it mix up some dyes oh yeah i'll be yeah. dying soon okay michael we got to wrap this up this has been this is fascinating stuff what a what a ride and what a Tremendous thing you've taught yourself through the years here. It's, it's just terrific. Thanks for sharing it. Well, thanks for having me. This has been delightful. And thanks to everyone for listening.